Welcome everybody. Thanks for showing up right on time. I may give it uh, two minutes here for people to file in, but uh, when I do the live teach, I do start right on time. So thanks, thanks for doing that. Um, but since you're here, feel free to fire away some questions. I want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, got a lot to potentially cover. Starting off with uh, some habits, key habits as a foundation uh, for the study process, for your mindset, really as a foundation, and then getting into some uh, quant, some verbal, potentially even a little of data insights if we have some extra time. Um, and I got the poll open there. We're going to be using the poll uh, as we always do in the live sessions, uh, or I always do in my my live teaching. Um, that way, you can see where everyone's at. Um, use the timer, and that's really helpful. Uh, looks like there's a range so far of how much people experienced with the TTP. Um, but any questions for sure that people want to address today, please uh, fire away in the chat if you want. Also, be curious where people are from. I'm uh, here in Seattle, pretty rainy here. <laughs> I was just at uh, South by Southwest Education Conference in Austin. That was uh, pretty cool. It was my first time going. Um, cool. Well, I don't want to hold you up too much more. So let's let's jump in and get started. Um, again, Ben Resnick. I've been a GMAT specialist since 2016, uh, full time with the GMAT. And taking it five times, scored up to a 780 and five times above a 760. I'm studying now to take my focus exam. I only have so many attempts, so I really got to study hard. But I like to put myself in the ring and uh, study hard, like just like you guys are, and really take it seriously. Um, the last time I took it, I was doing like the TTP, um, like I called it fake tests every single day leading up to my exam. So I would do the in the custom test feature. I found that really helpful. So whatever level you're at, um, the TTP has something, even though, you know, I had the content solid, I was working on more of the mindfulness aspect of it. Um, so, uh, sometimes people say that you're, you, you plateau and that's totally a myth uh, that, uh, I mean, there, there can be times where, um, just like with weight training, potentially you'll, you'll maybe not, you know, stop increasing for a short period of time, or maybe there's a little bit of ups and downs, but if you keep training hard and, you know, learning from your mistakes, um, you know, potentially if you're not getting expert help, getting coaching or coaching yourself or using a good process of learning from mistakes, then, you know, that plateau can stick. But if we do have a good process, we'll always, always keep improving. So that's really important to keep in mind. Um, again, for the people who just came in, our agenda is we'll talk some habits, um, a little bit about the format, uh, mindset, and then get into some problems and content. So just a review of the format, um, a little bit on the timing. So average around two minutes, but you do have a little bit extra now on the focus edition, 209 for quant, which is that extra nine seconds can be helpful. Um, the data sufficiency now is in data insights, but within the course we, we include it in quant because it is more the quant content. And then normally we recommend doing the other four topics here um, that are in data insights after covering the quant and the verbal, because it's gonna cover the same skills. Um, one note on the timing here is, and I'll, I'll show more details on this on some research I did, data sufficiency averages six questions. So if you were at two minutes on these, then for these other ones, you'd have 221 on average, but you may want more time for, say, two-part analysis and multi-source reasoning. And, you know, it'll depend on the difficulty of the question, but ideally, um, some of the easier or faster question types, you're, you're banking time. That's what I like to do. So... I can do data sufficiency really quickly. And then for something that's really complex, maybe on two part, the hardest two part analysis or multi source reasoning will be much more complex. And then, uh, you know, I'll have, we'll have some extra time to double check. The other thing that's really a huge difference in uh, focus edition is you do have the uh, section review. So you can change up to three answers at the end. Um, some of you, you know, maybe I've seen that, but you do want to practice with that, really get used to that strategy. A uh, very helpful thing is to flag problems that uh, you're stuck on or that look particularly hard if you have time pressure. So if something looks really long and hard, um, sometimes there is an easier way, but on average, um, say it's like six sentences long with seven numbers in it, um, you know, chances are it's likely to take more time and most people will be under time pressure. 
So it depends on, you know, your, your level and uh, how you're doing and if you're going for a perfect score and whatever. But for most people, you know, you flag that one and just come back to it at the end. There's not really too much downside there because most people aren't going to be wanting to change more than three answers. There's just not, not generally that much time. And uh, if you are that fast, you're, you're probably, it's unlikely you'll have more than three that you'd want to change. Um, and there was a question in the chat here. Data sufficiency questions now more complex or using tougher numbers. No, it's actually less complex, I would say, overall, or I don't know, it's, um, it's not necessarily less complex. The way to describe it is they're more word problem-y. So there's no more algebra, but actually when I was taking practice tests, even scoring a perfect score, I was averaging about one minute for the data sufficiency and some of them not even writing anything. Um, so I actually personally found those the easiest. Um, and I think the some of the number properties ones that they used to have were actually the most confusing, like a really complicated inequality where you're having to test all kinds of numbers. This will be more like word problems. I saw a bunch of weighted averages where when in the course, I'll actually teach um, a separate technique for it, a teeter-totter weighted average technique that can, getting that concept can um, really help us be most efficient. And yeah, as someone said, you do have the on-screen calculator, but that doesn't mean that the numbers will be harder um, for the most part, you really, if you're solid in your arithmetic and estimation, you won't even need that calculator. I'd say it's less than one out of 10. I'll even use it probably on data sufficiency. Now I am quite experienced with arithmetic. Totally. You can, if you want to do a certain calculation, but, um, for the most part, you can estimate it would be like 10% of something. Right. And so, um, or comparing, you know, numbers that are way off and just which one's larger. So, um, yeah, getting solid with the mental math definitely helps. Um, all right, we can keep moving here. All right, so this is some research I did from seven practice tests. So it's easy to remember if you just say this data sufficiency is an average of six questions, five for two part analysis that's split between quant and verbal. And overall, just from the official guide, I saw about 55% of them verbal, 45% quant. Um, there is something kind of called logic based, which we would consider under verbal. That's a little bit new, so that's that's a little bit tricky. And then for multi-source reasoning, there either normally be three or six, so that's an average of four, but there'll be three or six. I saw more often three, and then three graphs, and I always saw two tables. Um, reading comp, most of the time I'd get four passages. There was one out of seven where I got three. And then the breakdown here, feel free to screenshot that uh, now, or you'll have the recording later. Um, essentially, data sufficiency used to be really huge, 23%. Now it's still big, about 10%, um, but uh, less than it used to be. Reading comp gets a little bit of a bump. Um, and then, yeah, problem solving a little bit more than before. All right, and then just keep in mind that a lot of times people had a goal of 700 because that's a round, exciting number. Um, so the scale changed. It's about, at, you know, towards the top of the scale, it's about 50 points different um, around, you know, between here and here. It's like around 50 points different. So um, yeah, it's, it'll be around a 645 that's gonna convert now to a 700. So just keep that in mind when you're thinking of your goals. Um, one you know, important point on goals is really look at what um, uh, your score range is for your goal schools, You know, knowing what that goal is. And I do recommend, um, it can be helpful to set a tentative goal for your, uh, for your test, but I it generally recommend it to be tentative um, and because it really can be a bit hard to predict exactly when you'll be ready. You will go into that test much more you know, confident, prepared, and less likely to waste an attempt if you have already reached a your target score on a practice test. So I generally do recommend that. Um, a nice thing is with the online version, you can book that almost like almost all the time slots will be available 24 hours in advance. So it has to be over 24 hours, but if you just say, okay, I'm ready, and then you wanna test right right after that, you totally can. Um, you do have to look in your area for the in-person. Uh, it may book out for the time you want more in advance, so you will have to you know, look in your area, um, and it is harder to get the time slot you want. Now, one tip on that for, that I researched is, um, and also from experience, on average, a person is gonna be most ready to take, uh, focus-wise, to take the test, like three to four hours, uh, after they've awoken. So for a lot of people, kind of like late morning, you know, depending when you wake up is often good. Um, a lot of people are more tired in the afternoon and really that preventing careless errors in your mindset, all these details really count for a lot. So you want to be thinking about your morning routine uh, as you're taking practice tests, simulating that actual test 
a lot of people say they're going to do it, but then they they don't. So um, a lot of these fundamentals are, are really important to to really stick with. Um, cool. And thanks for filling out the poll. Looks like we do have um, a decent number of people who are a bit experienced um, uh, with this. So so that's that's good. Um, one sec here. All right, we'll look at the next one. Um, okay, mindset for excellence. I'll drop in the chat here. Uh, there is one that went into more detail on some of this mind, mindset stuff. Um, it was a master GMAT verbal webinar. So I'll drop that in the chat. Um, and again, for those who arrived, feel free to fire away questions. I'll try and take them as we go. Um, so yeah, a really big one. And there's a, there's a great blog on this. If you look at get excited for the GMAT um, in the blog, reframe any anxiety as excitement. There was a really cool study on this that if that people perform much better if they were able to just just by the simple act of thinking of their anxiety as excitement. Also, one of the I think it's a top 10 TED Talks uh, ever is make stress your friend uh, Kelly McDonagall, the the um, the upside of stress. So uh, just reframing that anxiety as excitement. Hey, this is getting my body excited. Like I in, in those mantras to yourself. I perform well under pressure. Um, you know, I, I'm a game time performer. Um, all those mantras. Um, I like to tell myself I'm sharp, focused, precise. Really, that precision is the number one habit um, on all across all the sections. So the thing I see that's most consistent and what what's hurting people's scores is misreading. Oh, just these careless errors, and they think it's just them. It really is. Almost all people are making these careless errors, but we have to be really proactive about preventing them. You know, practicing mindfulness, um, certain habits in our writing, like for instance, uh, probably the most common is rereading exactly what it's asking for, both at the start. You know, boxing that it's asking for why, you know, maybe we solve for X and then double checking that at the end. Yeah, and then uh, mindfulness and breath work. Um, so there's 3 techniques I really like um, really the foundation here is this diaphragmatic belly breathing. So you're going to let your belly expand on the inhale instead of just your chest. There's been a lot of research coming out more recently um, on the importance of this. And uh, so let's just get that a try real quick. Feels really awesome if you fully embrace it. Um, my favorite actually is the luxury breath at the bottom here. So just this is kind of sounds a little silly, but I just try and bear with me and give it a try. Um, imagine the breath is the most amazing, wonderful feeling of relaxation. Um, sounds a little woo woo, but like I, I'm not naturally that way. But uh, I, I try this; it's pretty cool. Like uh, feeling feeling all the all the tension melt away from a specific tense areas. So like a lot of times in the jaw, face, pelvis, neck. Or just the whole body. Um, I think actually even the nostrils can feel really nice. Um, so I give that a try. And another cool one, I was hearing about this on a few podcasts, and I think also Andrew, uh, Dr. Huberman, um, some of you maybe know him. Um, two sniffs in through the nose and then sigh and feel all your tension release with like kind of an ah. I like to say ah. Ah. So that's really nice. Um, there's a lot of research on that being good for your, you know, your brain, your brain function, cognitive function, and and staying relaxed. Um, and you do want to find the right balance of, you know, ideal activation states. You do want to play with it. There's different um, breath work you can do more for relaxation. A lot of these are a bit more relaxing. Um, but you can, there's other things you can do with more to get yourself elevated if you are a little sleepy. Um, yeah, that can be more fast breathing. So let's see. Um, and there was a question here in the chat. Any thoughts about online versus test center? Yeah, so we we're just talking about that. Um, I'd say the biggest advantage of online. Well, there's a couple of advantages is uh, you can book it, you know, pretty much anytime you want. I think that's the biggest one. And then also you don't have to commute. So no traffic, none of that hassle, no stress of all the commute and stuff. I guess the downside is some people stress a little of, oh, what if my Internet connection or there's a problem with the proctor? So maybe there's a bit higher likelihood that there's some sort of glitch. Um, I think if you have a good setup, it's less way less likely. Um, but so my personal preference is it is to do it at home. Um, but, uh, it's kind of depends on what people are comfortable with. Um, some people just like kind of feel better about, you know, getting out of the house. Uh, I'm more used to working from home. So it's kind of a little bit personal preference. Uh, and mine would be doing it at home. Um. Yeah, and I guess one other nice thing with at home that I liked is I just kind of had my whole routine without like I could do it up to the time of the test. So like I just 
you know, had 15 minutes to maybe I was lying down doing my mindfulness. And then there was no other steps of like car and driving and all that. It just was straight into logging in for the test. So I kind of went straight from my, my prep routine to into the test. Now, if you do it in the test center too, you can, there will be instruction screens that you can go through a routine as well with like breathing and getting into your zone, getting into your ideal state. Um, and I do encourage, yeah, creating some mantra for yourself. All right, so a couple other bullet points here, eliminating the self, negative self-talk. I think eliminates a little bit too strong, but but more of a recognizing it and just correcting it, uh, often called a reframe or thought restructuring. Um, so if you do hear that negative voice, instead of like, I'm so stupid or that was so dumb, I'm just saying like more of a mantra of, oh, I, I win or learn. And you know, don't beat yourself up for beating yourself up, right? If you catch yourself the negative self-talk, just kind of catching it and saying, you know, re, 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 uh, recorrecting from it, reframing. Um, outworking is a big one. You know, there's a lot of competition out there. It's reality is it's graded on a curve. So, you know, it, it, there is competition. And so, you know, putting the time in is really pays off. And good thing is with the TTP program, it is very thorough. So, you know, people who do put in their time are going to improve a lot and yeah, embrace discomfort. That makes it more fun. Like this attitude, um, maybe you've listened to some David Goggins podcast, or there's a bunch of other good ones. Um, but this idea of embracing discomfort. Uh, I have it on my fridge here behind me, but really helps a lot to just get in that mindset of, you know, what uh, doesn't kill me makes me stronger. What, you know, this discomfort is growth. Um, maybe some of you can have, have embraced that mindset even more in athletics. So if you can embrace any mindsets from athletics that have served you, maybe some people are less historically good at tests, but they can have more success in, in other activities. You know, embrace that mindset of what made you excellent in in some other activity and then channel that into, you know, building up your confidence as a test taker. All right. Oh, I just, there was one thing I, I was going to say earlier about the size. It was pretty interesting on that podcast, I guess on um, people, humans do it every five minutes anyway, but it can even be more beneficial to do it intentionally. So that's kind of a cool, cool fact about the size. Um, so keeping your why close, this is a really big one. Uh, I, I often have my private tutoring students uh, write down their why, both for the GMAT and the big picture. So having a why that's specific to like, what are some useful skills you actually learn on the GMAT? So a lot of times people are looking at it as a chore, but instead if we're embracing it, um, we, you know, we're, we're learning time management, focus, mindfulness, uh, some quant skills, some you know envelope math that's gonna serve us well, focus, precision, reading skills, uh, especially the critical reasoning. Um, one thing, I'd encourage everyone to do is in your daily life, just noticing things, flawed arguments. Oh, I took this pill and or I had this, this um, uh, tried this supplement and, and all my problems were gone or I had this food, but you know, we don't know for sure that that's the cause. Um, a lot of times there could be other causes or you know, these kind of causation arguments can be really flawed. Um, you know, president comes in and says, oh, the economy did great after I came in, but maybe it was other factors, not the president, right? So there's all these kind of things that come up in real life. Um, so, yeah, also another one is G GPT. I'll often catch it messing things up. So it's kind of like feels good to catch it, but, um, you know, it will do some dumb stuff sometimes. So, uh, you know, tr to try and look for that and celebrate those when you can catch it, um, you know, messing up, uh, getting things backwards. Um, Cause that's the same skills that, you know, are, are tested a lot on the GMAT. Um, but anyway, I, I encourage everyone to write your why, both the big picture of the MBA and all the big goals and the future and, and all the visions and all that. And then also the, the GMAT stuff, because there are a lot of good skills. Uh, a lot of times, yeah, instead of viewing it more as a chore, viewing it as, oh, we're building our reasoning skills. Um, sure, there might be some problems that don't, don't are less apply less to real life than others. And of course, there's other skills that are probably more important, uh, creativity and people skills and all these things. But um, there still are skills here that, that are really important and uh, we can really develop them. Um, so yeah, a means to an end. Uh, as well as, as well as, you know, celebrating the means, the journey itself, I would say. Um, and yeah, you know, sometimes you're going to have to push through with discipline when you don't feel like it without burning out. So it is finding the right balance there. But I encourage uh, a lot of times people say six days a week is pretty good, um, or at least something every day. You can mix in flashcards because it can be really good during any downtime. And uh, let's see. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, finding the right balance there of not burning out, but putting in the time. Um, often people do like to do mornings can be really helpful to if you're able to before work, because um, it can be really tough after work to put in some good study time. So, um, yeah. 
All right, here's another success story that's really cool on Amazing Grit, um, 350 score point score improvement. So I did this interview with Abdul. I'll put this one in the chat because this is a pretty legendary one. Um, and then, you know, being perseverant, really help, really important, um, staying committed, you know, all the, all the classic things. Um, growth mindset, you probably heard of this one, but a lot of times people are, you know, they'll get down on themselves. They'll say, I'll never get it, that kind of thing. Um, Growth mindset just means that we we have to embrace that we can improve, we will improve, um, and you know that's that's just so important um, because you will if you go if you do the follow follow the plan you will improve um, even if it's not always you know a straight line um, you definitely will improve. Atomic habits, I guess it sold. Someone said twenty million now. Um, I don't know. Last I saw it was only five, but. But pretty impressive either way um and great book and one percent better every day uh so then if you did that like every day for 365 days you're at 30 38 times as good so that's that's pretty cool um and i guess yeah habits it there's lots of ways to look at it like you know are you um getting up at a certain time and uh you know following your plan each day that's that discipline is super important then there's all the healthy habits are you eating well sleeping well sleep is huge um, one little anecdote is, uh, I had a student that like one week tired was like a 620 on the old VMAT and then the next week, 740, um, well rested 120 points up to like a 97 percentile or so. So, um, a lot of these habits, not just on the GMAT, like GMAT stuff, organization stuff, and then within the test itself, and then bigger picture in terms of your wellness, taking care of yourself, um, celebrate those little wins. And in terms of like the habits on the test, when you make a mistake, we'll talk about this a little more later. You wanna be reflecting on what's the habit, what's the habit I can change to prevent, proactively prevent this mistake in the future. That's a really huge one. Um, not comparing yourself with others. I'm sure you've heard this before. It's natural, it's probably gonna happen, but um, everyone's path is different. So you can't just say someone else got, you know, 780, someone told me in, in a week or something. <laughs> You know, whereas it took me a long, long, long time, um, you know, that it's every, everybody's different for that. So, so focus on your own improvement. Um, you know, a great quote is compare yourself to yourself, not yourself to others. So comparing yourself to yourself is, is good and celebrating that progress. Um, being strategic, walk before you run. Um, easy and medium are huge. So we don't have as good data for this new version, but on the old version, it was pretty interesting that uh, there was a case study someone posted where they missed actually 11 of the 12 hardest ones. And still that was like a 49 uh, out of 51. So still it's in the 70s percentile, like the, the percentile scale was different before, but two from perfect with 11 errors, um, of the, but only the hardest ones. So the point of that was to show that um, if you get all of the mediums, including hard mediums, you're in, tend to be in a, in a quite good place. Um, so you don't necessarily have to get, you know, all the hard ones um, to get a good score. And it does depend, you know, there is less room for error on those super high top 1% scores, but even still, I think we saw like a 99.9 .9 percentile, um, 765, I think was with 89% correct. So seven errors across the whole test. Um, so, you know, it does show you even still for that like almost perfect score, um, you don't have to actually be perfect completely on accuracy. The eighty nine percent that's like a B plus in school, and it's an A plus 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 on this test. So just keep that in mind. Um, at the same time, it is good to go for streaks, you know, on your test, and you know, learn from every mistake, and really work for the, towards that precision. But it also puts less pressure on you to know you don't you don't necessarily have to be perfect. That you know the adaptive test. If it gives if it's giving you hard questions, then that's okay um, to miss some. Um, yeah, and with be be strategic, um, you do want to go topic by topic. So that's how the course is set up. Um, there is these levels of competence. So there's a great blog post about that too in the TTP. But it's basically you need, you need to start by being able to like handle one topic at a time, and then you know harder questions in that topic and then more range within that topic. And then later on, you know, more, more spread out on topics. Maybe it's something you haven't covered as often. So as you're getting closer to your test date, you're gonna wanna be doing way more with like, you know, putting more of the time pressure on. Um, whereas the time pressure isn't so important at first, um, you wanna be able to build that competence first. And then, you know, later on mixing the difficulty with, you know, more time pressure, more different topics, 
Um, I was using that custom test feature a lot, you know, mixing up all the topics. I would give myself hard ones. And walk before you run, you really need to get the fundamentals first. So really focus on those easy mediums before you're doing those hard ones. And, and really build that mastery and foundations first. Uh, we talked about avoiding careless mistakes. It's really huge. Comes from improved skills. So uh, don't rush. A mantra I really love from John Wooden is be quick, but don't hurry. Um, and yeah, make accuracy your goal. Um, and think about, you know, when you do make a careless mistake, how could I pro proactively prevent that? Again, uh, rereading exactly what it's asking for at the start and at the end can, can probably the most common of those, but there's other ways to prevent errors. Um, another one is being aware of all the trap types, which the course goes into a lot of detail on that. And inevitably you are gonna make some mistakes and then it's just about how, how much are you learning from them. All right, a bit on study process. Um, this is a mantra I came up with, review, reflect, redo, you know, RRR. So a lot of people will do the review at first and then they'll look at it and be like, oh, I missed that. Okay, here's, you know, and they'll read the solution. That's not really enough. We need to do that extra step of reflecting on how we can improve and what do we need to do to prevent the mistake or move faster. Okay, and make it really actionable. And then this last key step, people are trying to often move through things quickly and move on to the next topic and they feel pressure to keep moving. But it is really important. You, you know, there's lots of questions in the course. It does keep track of all your mistakes. You can go into the custom tests and redo all your mistakes, all your slow ones. Um, you can, you know, track guesses as well. And you really want to go back and redo them. Um, you want to do spaced repetition, solidify your, your learnings and become fluent. Um, another big one is creating your own flashcards. Um, active quizzing is much, much more effective than writing notes and rereading them. So this can't be overstated. This is just a huge thing. Um, the research on this is insanely strong that most students will reread things, reread their notes over and over. And it's like 10 times more effective or some, some ridiculous amount to, to actually be quizzing it, even if it doesn't feel as good. Um, it's gonna be actually be more challenging when you're quizzing yourself, but that's, that's what's gonna help you. You need to get it out of your brain. So um, that's essential. Um, one other thing is like, even if you are you know, pretty advanced, you can um, do doing speed drills on the easy problems can also be useful. So one thing you can do is if you are more advanced, trying to beat the part time, like maybe do it in half the time. So maybe the average time is two minutes. Um, you know, maybe you can do it in one minute and that would be awesome. Um, and, you know, that is one where I said, don't compare, but you know, it does, you can get a feel for how you are doing relative to the, the other test takers. Um, not to get down on yourself, you know, if you are four minutes and the average is two, don't get down on it. Just realize that that's, you know, a goal, kind of a par, right? Uh, par time. So like on a golf course, right? A par, you know, par three, that doesn't mean it's easy to get a, a, a hole in three, but it's, you know, something to work towards. Um, then it gives you a sense, uh, the, the bigger point there is it gives you a sense of what that question, you know, roughly should take. Um, although there may be ways to do it faster, but the point is, um, the average time of two minutes doesn't mean every question will be two minutes. So some maybe average times one minute, some's average times three minutes, and that's fine. Um, the other thing is if you do notice, again, the one is looking really long, you can skip it, flag it, come back to it. Uh, tracking your errors, you can, you wanna put it in your error log, identify patterns. Um, and so, yeah, you can, you know, log, log it. Um, and yeah, here's the error tracker under the toolbox. Um, this is really nice. I don't know that that many people are necessarily using it as much as maybe it would uh, be helpful to, to use. Um, so under the on target, under lesson analysis, you can go topic by topic, super specific. So successive percent changes. There's 10 problems in the course. You know, there's there's 53 what percent problems. So you can target it. You, you click over here and you target that topic and um, get more practice on the specific ones that you're weaker on. Flashcards are both in the course and also uh, in, in encourage creating your own, uh, very important. And then global review. So going back, looking at patterns you notice, redoing old problems. Um, I would block off specific time for each week for global review. Um, again, good habit is to put it in your calendar. I also actually encourage a daily review. So with my tutoring students, I'll have them log their progress every single day. And that's a great habit to have that accountability with yourself, celebrate your wins, you know, see how well you're lining up with what your goals were each day.
All right. Um, yeah, I didn't mention this earlier, but um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't put this here, so I wouldn't forget. I am teaching a live teach cohort starts next Monday, uh, this time that is eight Eastern goes for 10 weeks. So it'll be 40 hours, four hours a week. Um, I'll drop the link here in the chat if you're interested in that. And, uh, yeah, let me know if any questions on that. Um, and would love to see you. All right, so we're going to get into a little bit of quant here, uh, then a little bit of verbal. So, yeah, on word problems, the translation is really key. We want to be have a fluent, confident, simple process. And that fluency, just like a language, the more we do it, the better we'll get. So, it can be really nice to have, like, an idea of, like, what does the word directly translate to? It won't always be this simple, but um, this is considered a hard question. And it's actually not so bad if we have, like, a direct translation table here on the right. So for what i think in the course it uses x personally i like using w like as just a habit if you had like you know f for football b for basketball you know r for revenue these kind of things um i like to use the letter that it's standing for all right and then percent just you divide by 100 of is times and one note on the word of a lot of times people will miss this up even on verbal of like we're talking about percent of something um a lot of times people aren't reading that. So you could have modifier words there. So it says like what percent of the males are employed? Well, um, you know, we have to make sure we're doing of the males, not just like the, t the total, right? Um, so you have to like really read this part after the of really carefully. Oh, sorry about that. Um, and so those modifying words uh, that's like limiting the category is really important. All right, so I'm gonna demo this one. All right, so P is 500% of Q. Oops, sorry about that. All right, P. All right, it's working now. Uh, sorry, 500% of Q, 500 over 100 Q. So 500 over 100, or 100 cross off, equals 5 Q. And better if we can just translate directly, but I was just showing you um, how that shook out. And then we got Q equals 400 over 100 Z. Sorry about that little bug there. I've never seen that before. Not what, not sure why it's unhappy today uh, for Z. And then Z is what percent of P? So it's Z equals W over 100 times P. All right, so we're, we're solving for the W. That's, that's what we need. And then we see that this has both Z and P in it. So we essentially want to get rid of the Q. We want to be um, subbing in for the Q. So we see this Q here is the 4Z. We're going to want to get rid of the Q and just have everything in terms of P and uh, P and Z. So we're gonna take the 4z, we'll plug it in here. Then we get from here, we will get p equals five parentheses, 4z equals 20z. Then we're gonna take this 20z, plug that in for the p. So um, I'll often, my personal thing is I don't, I often don't keep rewriting. Like, like a lot of times in solutions, people will rewrite over and over and over. I like to save time. It is trade-offs, I would say, do what you're comfortable with. Um, here, I'll rewrite it, but I'll often just cross things off. And you know, it, the, the upside of that is um, you do have to be careful, but um, you know, there's also a downside to keep rewriting things. Potentially you make a mistake. So you just want to prevent careless errors and notice when you make it and have that be like a little, uh, uh, I, I don't know, you could call it like a positive trauma, like response of like, uh, mindfulness, I guess, is a better way of looking at it. But like when you make the error, 
Like I made one the other day of, I, I'm always telling my students, you know, read like X ratio of X to Y. And I did it backwards on a practice test. I think it might've been my only error. So, so that like, but then next time since then I've been more careful. So anyway, um, we got W over hundred times the 20 Z. So what I would do here is I'm just gonna cr straight off cross the Z's, um, but this would be a one there. And then here we have 20 on the top, 100 on the bottom. Um, by the way, I tend to you know work decently fast. So, um, but just any time, um, any time, feel free to um, you know jump in, ask questions. That's how I do it with the live teaching. Is um, you know there there tends to be a lot to cover, so we try to move pretty quick. But um, I do want people to tell me to slow down because uh, I know I talk a little fast and uh, a lot fast sometimes, and just you know have me clarify. So, all right, so we have the 20 over 100. So we'll do 100 over 20. I like to do it in just one step, the 100 over 20 here. And yeah, so we get the 100 over 20 and that's just 5%. Um, any questions on that one? So, and I didn't show this here on the right, but essentially this 20 and this 100, this 100 over 20 all crosses off. So we're just left with the five and our answers here. Cool. So there was a question in the chat about the teeter totter weighted averages. Um, yeah, I'll actually pull that up. Um, so I didn't prepare it specifically for today, but I do love teaching that. So let me see. It can take a bit to get, but um, people do love the method once they get it. So if it is a little challenging at first, that's okay. Um, no worries. Um, Let's see, sorry, uh, it will be under general word problems, I think here. Yeah. All right, so steps here are on the right. So we're gonna draw the endpoints and the weighted average numbers on the teeter-totter diagram. And then the weighted average represents the final mixture and goes above the triangle shape fulcrum. So Mary scored 90 on four tests and 100 on X additional tests. Um, so we got, all right, 90 here on the left, 100 on the right. Overall average score was 92. So we'll put this over close to the 90. So that's important. And then we'll draw the weights on each side. So this is kind of like from physics, like the way a teeter totter would work from leverage. You could think if you had a long hammer, you wouldn't have to hit very hard as well. Um, but the larger weight goes on the side with the shorter distance from the fulcrum. So we'd only need a small weight here to balance out with a big weight here. And this is a great reality check. This method is a great reality check on your answers because now we know that this has to be a small number relative to this, this other one. So if the answer choices were say like one, uh, four, six, eight, ten, let's try it just quickly in the private chat. What do people think the answer, the answer would be there with that, without any formulas or math? So this here on the left is four. We're essentially saying that it has to be smaller on the right. Yep. So a bunch of people saying one, exactly, exactly. So yeah, so we can, do, we can show the math out, but essentially it's pretty common where a bunch of the answer choices totally don't work, often like three of them. Here there's four that wouldn't work, but it has to be smaller than four just because we know the, the teeter-totter diagram is telling us more weight on the left, less weight on the right. 
And it also makes sense. You can think of it in terms of profit margins. Um, so if you sell more of the high profit thing, they show this in the TV show, The Profit. Oh, we need to raise our profit margin overall, where you know we have a 50% margin thing and a 70% margin thing. And the diagram at first looked like this, and they were only at 55% margin, and they had a bunch of weight here. And and you know, Marcus Lemonis says, hey, we want to make it look like this, the diagram here, and sell more of the 70% mar margin thing here, and then end up with it saying we want to you know make the diagram look more like this. So it comes up in a lot of contexts. Um, same thing at a bar. If people are doing a mixed drink, right? You know, it's going to come out um, higher alcohol if you know you pour more in. So, so there's lots of real life scenarios. Um, now, side note: uh, recommend water, water for your GMAT because, uh, it, yeah, it, it does. You will sleep better and everything. But that's just a side note. Um, so okay, so. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, here we got weight two over weight one equals D one over D two. So a key thing is these distances are the distance from the 90 to the 92. This is going to be our D one. So that's the part where people get confused on what are the distances. It's the distance to the fulcrum. So D one here and D two here. So that D one is two. And this D two from 92 to 100 is equal to eight. So this is in a four to one ratio. So these also have to be in a four to one ratio. So we have D1 over D2, or yeah, D2 is equal to weight two over weight one. And then our D1 over D2 was um, two over eight. So we said equals, yeah, two over eight. And then our weight, um, our weight one was four. So then we just multiply the four across times four. And we end up with one. Weight two equals one. Uh, any questions on that method? It can take a bit to get. All right, we'll try one more and just quickly in the in the chat, what do people think? Any any guesses on this one? Let's do let's set the timer for 30 seconds. And just go ahead in the private chat. All right, five second warning if anyone else wants to guess before we discuss it. It's okay, this is brand new if you don't know. All right, so yeah, scored 90 on four tests, 100 on X additional tests, the average was 95. So the key thing here is we'll see 90, 100, the 95 is actually going to be right in the middle. So our distances are going to be equal. Therefore, our weights have to be equal. Essentially here, you have five over five on the right side for the distances. So our weights have to be equal, right? To get the ratio is one on the left. The ratio is also one on the right. So essentially, um, the larger weight goes on the side with the shorter shorter distance, but if they're equal distance, equal weights, and vice versa. So if we have four here, we're also going to have to have four here to balance it out. So essentially, the total amount above the average has to equal the total amount below above the average. So another way of thinking of it, 
is we're doing four weight times this distance, four times five. That's another way of thinking of it is weight one D one equals weight two D two. Four times five equals four times five. So let me know if there are any questions there. Otherwise we'll keep moving. All right, so I wanted to cover one thing on data sufficiency. It's really, really important habit that a lot of people miss. As a key habit is we often don't need to actually solve. We just need to know that we can answer the question. Now, there's some caveats here, but if we have two unique linear equations, so there has to be unique and linear equations and two variables we can solve. And sometimes there's a way to solve with less. And there's sometimes where the equations aren't unique and linear, then we also can't solve. So some of the caveats and traps to watch out for here, quadratic, if we add an X squared, you'll have two solutions like X squared equals nine. It could be three or minus three. Sometimes you could also answer a question with only one equation, but that would be a specific case, uh, normally called a combo. I'll show you that. And the equations could look different, but actually be the same. So X plus Y equals two is the same as 2x plus 2y equals 4. So on this one, without actually doing the solving, this is super basic, but we see the equations are different, x plus 2y, x plus y, they're, they're linear. So this is gonna be both statements together. To solve for y, we're gonna need both statements, two equations, two variables, we'll be able to solve. So that would be both statements together. Tell me if any questions, otherwise I'll keep moving. So here's that potential trap where x plus 2y equals 3, 4x plus 8y equals 12. Well, if we just divided by 4 here, so 4x plus 8y equals 12, we could divide both sides by 4, and we would just get x plus 2y equals 3. And it's just the same as equation 1. So this one... Uh, normally we would go through the process. I kind of shortcut it on the last one, but first statement insufficient alone, second statement insufficient alone. Then together, a lot of people, if they're not, uh, haven't learned this, this trap, they might think together it's sufficient, but these equations are not different. It's the same X plus two X plus two Y equals three and X plus two Y equals three for statement two. Therefore it is not sufficient. We have insufficient, and it would be E, statements together are not sufficient. And then the third one is if we see a combo. So it says X plus Y. So it's asking for the two variables combined. It's more common that we'll be, when you have a combo of multiple variables, that we'll be able to solve directly for it with less info. So on this one, statement one, X plus two Y, there's no way to get X plus Y. So we have one insufficient. Statement two, this one is that combo, combo trap, where uh, we actually can get it from just the one equation because we take the 2x plus 2y, we'll divide by 2, and we just get x plus y equals 2. So we can get it directly. Um, it's kind of think about it as two birds with one stone, just from that one one equation. So let's try one minute for this one, see how we do. I'm gonna get the poll up. Um, it, this time it should be able to be able to answer it. Be curious how we do.
10 second warning. You can do your best guess. I know that's short time. All right, I made that pretty short just so we could cover a few more things. But um, here, yeah, I didn't talk about this step, but we always want to do a rephrase. Those last ones were just mini drills where it just said, what is why or something, but um, we're going to read it, summarize what it's asking for. So each album costs the same, each song costs the same. Okay, and we're asking for the cost of three albums and two songs, singles. So we're going to write 3A plus 2S, question mark, and box that is a good habit. That's called our rephrase step. So that comes before everything else. Then we'll look at statement one, 18A plus 12S equals 72. So we wanna be on the lookout for a combo. Is there a way that this would simplify? And be essentially, is this a multiple of this? So potentially you can see visually, this is six times and this is six times. And then you can just say, oh, well, we're gonna be able to divide by six and just get it. You could say sufficient without showing more work, but essentially if you're gonna show more work, you divide by six and we get three A plus two S equals whatever. Doesn't actually matter, but that's 12. Um, we, yeah, we don't actually necessarily have to do the calculation. We just know that we're gonna get that value, get a value for it. And we would say sufficient. And then statement two only just gives us one of the variables. So that's, that's totally not sufficient because we have two variables insufficient. Any questions on that? All right, I want to cover a little bit of reading comp because people really love my lessons on that. And yeah, I helped write the uh, a lot of the lessons for this. Uh, I was thinking it was about three years ago now. Um, one thing about reading comp is a lot of times people think like not sure how to practice, um, how to learn. There's definitely some key habits that, you know, with the course, um, you, you want to get into and I'll, I'll cover the most important ones today, but um, it's not just about necessarily reading more that can help some uh, and doing more questions. You really need to be practicing good habits. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to, I'm going to go through some of these key habits. Um, be able to prove your answer is correct. Focusing on exactly what's being asked and finding specific language that supports your answer. So a good way to, to think about it is you want to pretend you're having to explain or prove that answer to someone else by citing specific language in the passage. If we just are going based on our feel, that's going to result in way more mistakes. And the good news is we can off with certain strategies, we can find the info we need much more quickly with the strategy I call sniping. We'll talk more about that. First reading, curious and engaged, main ideas, tone and structure. Do not try to memorize or focus on details. We will go back to the passage to answer the specific questions. So a lot of times people are spending actually too long on the first reading, trying to understand everything fully uh, and all the memorized details and all that. Um, you know, especially on a complex passage, it will be hard in the time to understand everything. We can always go back to it based on what it's asking. So I think just the generic advice to like, um, you know, make sure you understand everything. Like um, it, it's, it's way easier said than done. More specifically, we need to, I, you get points for answering the question being asked. So I think taking a very specific targeted approach tends to be, be much more effective. But it is good on that first reading still to get main ideas, tone, structure. That'll help us when we go back, know we're, have an idea of where things are. All right, these marker words are super helpful. So for contrast, the big one that's most common is however. And that was really helpful when I first learned about that. Um, comes up a ton. So it signals a main point. You also have although, while, a bunch of others. Uh, conclusions, you also have the, often have these verbs plus the word that. So you could have argues that, believes that, claims that. Uh, causation, this comes up on critical reasoning a lot too. Due to, as a result of, attributed to. Uh, look above markers, so it's a clue to look above. If you have a word like this, this discovery, it implies that there was something else, you know, talked about a discovery above. Or for example, that's supporting a point above. 
Um, the course goes into a lot more detail on a whole bunch more markers. Um, another thing is like extreme. So if you have all, that's a lot, you know, that's very extreme versus some just means greater than zero or um, a, a word that's, you know, like could versus um, will, will definitely, you know, those are different, right? Could is just a possibility or must, could versus must, I guess would be the, actually the opposite word. Could versus must is extreme. So, um, yeah. And then additional points. So a lot of times you'll have something like moreover, which shows it's an additional point supporting uh, a more main point above. Correct answer choice will often use different words, but with the same meaning. So you could have focus versus concentrating or research versus experiments. Another thing is reverse language. So it could say X is more than Y. And then the correct answer could say Y is less than X. Uh, primary purpose questions will often find main ideas in the first two sentences of the first paragraph, first sentence of following paragraphs. Also with those contrast and conclusion markers and potentially a conclusion in the final sentence, especially if it's argumentative in the passage. So this is probably the number one thing because about three quarters of the questions or maybe 80% almost um, will be uh, specific questions, uh, inference or detail, which are quite similar actually. Um, it's asking about something specific. So what we wanna do is in the, in the stem of the question, there'll often be like a capitalized word or a number um, if you focus on a long technical word, that's easier to find. So I think I have a small example below. Um, let me see. I guess, yeah, well, we're, we're going to maybe, yeah, we maybe have time to do this one quickly. But essentially, like a number like this, 2017 study from the Macomb School of Business, we would find that here. Right? So essentially, you're just sniping, you're finding, this number is really easy to find, 2017. Right, and then we just search for it there. I'll go back for a sec. Um, let's see, there is maybe one more point there. Yeah, so if there's a comparison or disagreement, we need to find both things that are being compared. So that's a pretty common thing. They'll, they'll ask about a comparison. And this is really essential, finding the right info. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm when, often when I see people that that haven't got this technique, they're just kind of being like, "Oh, it's they're, they're going by feel more. It's not it's not good enough. We need the proof. Find the proof in the passage." Um, one other little mini example here is it might it, a lot of times it will be the exact words that are in the question, but it, it could also be like um, a meaning match. So it says the question can say, "What's a goal?" and then of X. And, and it could say in order to blank X. So it could match the meaning and not the exact word. It could also say like Y in the question, Y in the question. And then um, a, an explanation type word like due to or caused by that would uh, be answering that question of why. And then there's all these trap types. We, we don't have time to go into all of them, but essentially making sure the entire answer choice is correct. Um, going beyond what the passage says, opposite, you know, distorting what the passage is saying. Um, there's a bunch of these traps. The, the key isn't necessarily to, um, I don't want people to get overwhelmed with this, but the idea is to, you know, understand why the wrong answer is wrong. Then we can more proactively prevent mistakes. It's okay, it's not necessarily that important that, you know, there can be some overlap between a stretch and a distortion. So it's less important to necessarily calculate um, categorize it perfectly, but I'm um, having a sense of these of why it's wrong is really helpful. And really that it just, they all fall into one thing. The, the full answer we chose doesn't answer the question with clear support from the passage. Um, one other thing to keep in mind that I that forgot to mention earlier is when you're doing that analysis, especially on verbal, um, you want to treat, like you can kind of treat each answer choice as a question in itself. So knowing why, um, why it's right or why it's wrong. Um, that process of understanding that's really helpful. Now at full speed, you know, you may not be able to fully articulate it, um, but building that skill of knowing why is important. And then especially when you do make an error and you're going back to review, you do wanna be thinking, realizing there's two errors with every error, you've chosen the wrong answer. And so you need to analyze that. And you also have rejected the correct answer. 
So really making sure you've identified both errors, um, really important. Um, let's see, yeah, we're almost out of time here, or we, we are, we're right at the end, but I do, I would like to show one, um, one example, yeah. So, yeah, maybe I'll just go through it instead of giving you it so we can end pretty close. Um, so, statements about the 2017 study from the Com McComb School of Business. All right, we get it right here. And then we notice it says, for instance, so that's supporting a point above. Carr notes that studies have found that, so Carr is studies found that something. This exposure to internet-based notifications disrupts people's ability to focus. Now, one note is, um, if I was doing this full thing, uh, this was like the first question, I would normally, my personal preference, some people don't do this, but I like to read the question first, then the passage, and then I would go back. I would actually note that it's here. I'd finish reading the passage and then answer the question. Some people prefer to read the passage first completely, but I think it is definitely more efficient to, if you are able to keep that many much stuff in your mind, to just have a sense of like what were the keywords, being a little bit extra aware as you read, and then, um, you know, say it's worth some technical word, um, lymphatic or, or you know some some complicated word. Um, myo myotatic reflex was one one passage that we have. Um, then you can be aware of it, and you're more likely, you know, it's less likely you're gonna have to spend a lot of time trying to find it. So um, experiment with that, I would say. But here it's gonna be easier. So just in the interest of time, I'm skipping to this part, but we have a good sense it's gonna be in that part. Um, either you know direct, directly connected to that sentence before that it's connected to or below. Then participants, so in the study, they suffered a decline in focus despite the smartphones being turned off. And okay, and then Carr finds it alarming that nearly all of them, the participants were ignorant of this effect, claiming that their phones had not been a distraction. All right, so let's go through these answer choices. So participants did not realize, okay, that they didn't realize something, but did they not realize that the smartphones were turned off? So it says they were ignorant of this effect, but what were they ignorant of? They were ignorant claiming that their phones had not been a distraction. So it's a half right trap. So they didn't realize something. They didn't realize it was a distraction, but it wasn't, they didn't realize that their smartphones were turned off. So this part's wrong. So that part's wrong. All right. It found that turning off a phone causes a decline in focus. It doesn't say anything about causation. So this word causes is wrong. If they turned off the phone, they had a decline in focus, but it doesn't mean that it was a causation. All right. So it has to be very, very specific evidence to show a causation. It tends to be pretty sketchy on the GMAT causation. And then uh, participants believe, so this is the one that a ton of people pick. This is the toughest trap here. Is participants believe that smartphones were not were not distracting, but it actually you have to, this is a yellow flag here. This word generally, generally is a, a broad generalization. Um, it might not stand out as much as a word like all or every, but it's still a broad generalization. Generally would apply in general. It, it they're actually just saying in this situation. So the participants could totally believe that smartphones are generally distracting. But in this case, since they were turned off, they, they shouldn't be distracting. So this is a, um, a stretch trap because of the word generally. If it said, we're not distracting in this, in this case, then it would be right. Then this D is the second most tempting trap. Uh, participants decline in focus was alarming to Carr. Something was alarming to Carr. Carr found it alarming, but what is it, what exactly is alarming? Nearly all of the participants were ignorant. So it actually, it specifically says that he's alarmed that they were ignorant of the effect. So that's pretty tempting, um, but it, he's actually saying that the, the, it's not necessarily the decline in focus that was alarming. He said it was alarming that they were ignorant, that they didn't realize it. So we have to be very, very specific in exactly what the answer choice means and exactly what the passage says. And then with E, um, it uses different wording, but it's correct. So. Participants' perceptions of the impact of smartphones were inaccurate. So it's definitely different wording, but they were ignorant of this effect, claiming that their phones had not been a distraction. Therefore, this perception that they were ignorant of, they were ignorant, and their perception 
was inaccurate. Um, they, they thought that their phones had not been a distraction, but they, they actually was distracting. Um, any questions on that 1? that's really tough. That's that's considered very hard. So just as a heads up, um. That, that is not an easy 1, so that that a ton of people choose C. So that's about as hard as they get. In terms of statistics, but, um, it's not as hard if you are aware of certain things and traps. So this generally. And, um, you know, making sure that that we're not just getting matching words. We have to make sure that the whole choice matches. Um, so, I'm happy to go a bit over if there's any other questions on this or anything else. I can open it up. Yeah, so guessing strategies if you run out of time. Uh, yeah, so you definitely don't leave them blank. I would just guess whatever it doesn't your your odds of any choice. Um, if you're totally out of time, you just want to recognize you're out of time and make sure to finish all the answers. So, um, I would say you want to be aware of your time as you go. So, so let's say it's like 2 minutes per question. Um, essentially. You will have a little bit more time than this, but. Essentially, if you like create a little chart for yourself, say for quant, right on question 1. At the start of question 1, start of 1. Right your time. Minutes is 45 and then on question 6, if we did 2 minutes per question, we'd have like 35. And then 25, then 15 and then 5 that actually, because it's an extra 9 seconds per question, it does leave you with an extra few minutes. To go back and review, so this is a pretty good chart if we did this, like, um, this is for quant. Right on question 16 question 21 at the start of 1, just because you're more likely to look at the time after you're finished the question, but essentially every 5 questions. Right, um, this would leave you like 3 minutes left to review. So, just having an idea of the time and then if you notice you're behind those benchmarks, then. Um. You're going to want to, uh, and potentially here, you could, you know, you could adjust this a little. So if you wanted to have it right on pace, um, you could say, this is, you know, like 20, um. You know, 24 minutes, and then you'd end up with, um, you know, less, a little bit less extra time, but, um. Essentially, if you're behind your pace, then you, maybe you're guessing on the ones that look harder. So the guessing strategy that I would say is guess on. Potentially to get to so that you finish, you guess on ones that are looking looking particularly hard and long. Um, it's probably more obvious for quant, I would say, um, but yeah, potentially something that's really confusing, like cutting your losses quickly, being decisive. So when I talked about skills that we learn in the GMAT, it's like being decisive and uh, not panicking, not getting too attached. That is one thing they're testing as like a management test of like making quick decisions. So being decisive is important. Um, instead of wavering, like it's, you know, sometimes you're a toss up between 2 choices. Um, it potentially when you're practicing, you want to take that extra time to really think carefully. But as you're getting up to test pace close to your test, you really do need to practice that skill of like making the decision quickly. And, you know, if, if, if you don't have a good basis for it, potentially you just flag it. If you're 50, 50 on it, you're really not sure. Um, if you have a good path to a solution, you know, maybe you, you finish. So, it's not necessarily about how much time you've already spent. It's more about how much time might you continue to spend. Right? So that that's the issue is if, like, you're confused, you know, then you flag and you flag and come back to it. But definitely make sure to finish. Yeah. Um, anything else here? Yeah, let me see. Um, pulling up the chat. Oh, yeah, the test section order. So, starting with your strength, they're saving that for middle or last. Yeah, so I like to start with my weakness, actually. Um, it is a personal preference, but I like to basically, the way I think about it is I want to be the most focused or at least at least fatigued on my hardest section. And, you know, it, it depends. It's kind of a judgment call. Like some people want to build their confidence. So, it is, you know, a judgment call on that. But my personal preference is, yeah doing the 
the hardest for me first when I have my most stamina. And um, one thing, it's not that big a deal, but it, it, it is something to be slightly, slightly aware of is um, it, it does adapt by section. So if you do really well, that's the other potential reason to do your hardest first is um, it may be less intimidating. So if you do your uh, hardest last, then, but you did really well on the first two, then you will tend to get a bit harder questions at the very at that test. So that score I told you about with nine errors, the the three errors and still got all an 89 on data insights when normally other tests I've seen uh, three errors would be more like 85, 86. I think I've seen usually 85 with three errors. That person had an 89 because they got almost perfect score on the first two sections. They had like 87, 88, and then 89. So they got harder questions. And then with three errors, they got almost perfect on that as well. So that was pretty interesting. Um, GMAC officially claimed that it only adjusts it very slightly, but from that evidence, from that particular thing, um, it did seem like it was more than slightly. Um, we don't have like amazing data, but um, yeah, it is pretty interesting that, uh, that, that that factor as well that not everyone's aware of. Um, so for me, I will probably, and, and we also we also have seen that if you get all the questions right, that it ends up in a perfect score, no matter whether um, it was, no matter what, it, from the data we've seen. So for me, I will probably do my first, um, yeah, either data insights or verbal first. And then I think quant would be my strongest um, do last. Any other questions? Good questions, thanks. Yeah, it was fun to do the teeter-totter. Thanks for asking about that. Um, yeah, it was nice to, nice to cover quite a, quite a bit of variety today. Um, I will drop in the chat one more time, the live teach in case you are interested. Uh, would love to see you there. Um, Cool. Well, it looks like that's all the questions. Thanks so much for showing up. Really appreciate your questions and energy and everything. Uh, good to see you and hope to see you again. Um, yeah, have a great rest of the week and take care. Good luck with your prep.